Praise the Lord. This is Pastor Samuel Morris, pastor of Fountain of Living Waters Church in Queens, New York. You're watching The Oasis, our television outreach program. Praise the Lord. Now, we all know what an oasis is. An oasis is a paradise in the middle of the desert. Amen. What are the two outstanding features of the oasis? The trees and the water. The trees to shade you from the blazing hot sun that was beating down and drying the life out of you and good, refreshing, life-giving water. Amen. Glory to God. When you got born again and came into Jesus, you, you came out of the desert and you came into the oasis. But you know, too many Christians uh, come in and get the shade from the tree. Yes, they're, they're going to heaven when they die. Amen. But they never partake of the life-giving waters. They don't get the vibrancy of the Christian life that's supposed to be lived today in the earth. Just like um, a, a traveler in the desert who's hungry, who's thirsty, looks for the oasis, and it's a sign of hope for him. We as Christians, our life is supposed to be so refreshing and it's supposed to be so vibrant that the people who are still in sin, amen, and if that's you still in sin, we're going to give you the answer to that before the program is over, so stick with us, amen. Your life as a Christian is supposed to be so vibrant and inviting to the people still in the desert of sin that they want to come in and make Jesus the Lord of their life. Amen. As we go into the word of God, as we study, we are going to learn how to walk in the fullness of everything God has for us. We're going to drink the water. You know, when I was in school, we had a little saying about good, better, best, never let it rest till your good is better and your better best. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that God wants us to have days of heaven right here on the earth. So when you get born again, uh, you come under the trees, you get in the oasis, you drink the water, things are supposed to get good and they get I know this is bad English, but they get gooder and gooder and gooder and better and better and better. Then when we leave this life and go to the next life, amen, then we get the best. Amen. I was watching a program the other day, a nature program, and I was watching the gigantic whales down to the little tiny krill, the little shrimp, the crab, starfish, all the different colored fish. And it came to me with such an impact that the God who created all of this lives inside of me. How can any situation, how can any problem in life defeat me when I have the creator of everything living inside of me? Amen. Let's go to the word of God. Now, when the teaching is over, don't go away because I'm going to be right back. We're going to talk a little bit more. Amen. As the program is playing, you're going to see contact information. Amen. Uh, you can order these broadcasts um, in any format you like. Um, again, use the contact information. Get in contact with us. Amen. Let's go into the word of God. God bless bless you. And our job is to keep people from going to hell, not to keep them safe and not to keep them alive and keep them healthy so they can do the things to send them to hell. You understand? So no, you want, you want sex, sexual counseling in the church? Are you married? No, don't have sex. Well, we're going to do it anyway. Okay. Then you got to leave my office and you got to leave this facility and you got to go to the health department or go to some secular place that, um, where, um, they are only interested in the health and the morals. Um, they are not dealing with that. We deal with the morals here and your physical health is really of a secondary importance in this particular thing, um, in this particular area sexually, because if we keep you healthy by giving you a condom, we are condoning your behavior and we're telling you it's all right to do it. Now, even though with our mouth, we're saying, oh, no, no, but we're taking the condom. And while we're giving them the condom, we y'all shouldn't be doing that. But here's the condom. Y'all shouldn't be doing that. But here's the birth control pills. No, no, no. My friend, the church is supposed to be the church. And if you don't like what the church is doing, here's another issue that's going to blow your ministry out of the water. This is why at all costs, you have to stay away from accepting government money. 
Because once you get start feeding at the public taxpayer trough, then they could come in and tell you what services you have to offer. Okay, so you get some money over here to build the senior citizen center. That's great. But if you're not careful and you don't have the thing set up and structured right, amen. Um, if you don't have a separate entity handling that, if it's the church handling that directly, then when the homosexuals go to the um, board and complain, hey, this church is taking and tax player money and they don't want us to um they they say we can live in the house but we can't practice our homosexuality and they're taking public money for this house y'all you know and then the government comes in then you have no choice because you're taking the money from the secular government and you're gonna have to do what the secular government says do Amen. No, you're supposed to live by faith and do whatever you're doing by faith and trust God to get the money so that if the government tells you that if you don't do it this way, you don't get any money from us, you tell them, big deal, we ain't getting any money from you anyway. So, you know, you take your program and set up a building down there and set up, you know, build some houses and let them go in there and do their stuff, be freaky deaky all they want. But we, the church, that is not what we believe. Amen. We don't have any of your money, so you can't make us do any of this. You feeling me? Amen. But so many of us, we're, you know, we, we want to fund this and we'll fund that. Amen. Instead of telling the people, teaching the people how to give, amen, all the leaders, they want to get at that public trial because there's so much money there and uh, so a lot of it doesn't go to the program. It's going in their pocket. Amen. So, you know, and they don't really care about the, 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 the spiritual part of the people. Amen. Glory. As long as they got their, their, they got their feed bag on. Amen. No, my friend. But the church is the moral authority. Amen. And if it costs us some money, if it costs us some dollars, if it costs us some butts in the seat, amen, some feet in the seat and the faces in the places, so be it. But we have a standard that we have to uphold. Amen. And we're not supposed to be having a double standard. We're not supposed to be a hypocrite. The base word in New Testament that we get our word hypocrite from means to play act, an actor where, you know, you're playing a role. And unfortunately, that is what the church is doing too much. They're playing a role. We get the Bible and we put on the backward collars and we call ourselves Reverend Doctor and this and that. And we got a long string of letters under our at the end of our name which is supposed to signify that we have been called by God and we went to um, some school or something so they could teach us how to rightly divide the word of truth. Amen. And here we come sitting on TV telling people about come here and get some condoms and come here and get some birth control. No, you're supposed to come here and get Jesus. Come here and get your life in order. Come here and find out what requirements that your creator has for you. Now, again, because this is not a theocracy, we don't live in Israel, amen. We live in a secular land, a secular, under a secular government. You are free to live the life, at least here in the United States to a certain degree, you are free to live whatever immoral lifestyle you want. That's your business, amen. Go ahead, do what you want to do. But we as the church cannot condone you and help you to do that. And if we pass you out condoms and we pass you out at the church birth control, again, unless you're already a married person with up teen children and you don't just don't want anymore and you don't want to go in there and get anything snip, 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 amen. Other than that, we have no business, um, you know, doing anything um, with, 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 with that kind of stuff. Amen. Glory to God. We are the church. Amen. And we need to be the church. And I'm going to point out this one thing and we're going to move on. You're going to notice that the churches that have the Holy Ghost power and the anointing are not handing out condoms and birth control to unmarried folk during the week. And the churches that are handing out through their social programs, condoms and birth control pills to unmarried people during the week, there's no anointing in the church on Sunday, on Friday, on Wednesday, or whenever you have service. It's just a meeting because there ain't nothing going on there because the Holy Holy Ghost and the secular, they don't miss. Mix. Jesus said, my kingdom, I'm um, told Pilate, among other people, my kingdom is not of this world. We don't do things in my kingdom the way they do things in the kingdom of the world. It's totally different. One of the problems, we are confusing people because we're trying to mix too much stuff.
Now let that sink in a minute. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Amen. Glory to God. Because listen, I'm drinking a cup of tea here. And tea is good. Coffee is good. But you don't mix the two of them together. I had an instance one time with my wife when we were dating. We went to the IHOP for breakfast one day. So she got a cup of tea and she put milk in it. And then without thinking, she took the lemon and put in it, forgetting that she had already put the other one in there. And you know what acid does to milk, lemon, citrus, any kind of thing? It made it curdle. So we looking in the cup of tea where the milk and the lemon is, and we see little curds start um, rolling up in there because the lemon and the milk, she had to ask for another cup of tea. Amen. So milk in your tea, if you like that, that's fine. Lemon in your tea is good. If you like that, that's fine. But you can't mix them both together. Amen. So people want to live an immoral lifestyle. That's their business. But they got to go up the street to the other folk to do that because you don't do that in the church. The church is for the people who've decided they want to live right. They want to do right. Might not be living right right now. Might not be doing right right now. But we know we've come to the realization that the lifestyle we have is not correct. Amen. This ain't the way mama taught me. This ain't the way grandpa taught me, and I want to get my life together. So I come to the church, and I'm here for the church to help me get my life together, not help me to be healthy and go live longer so I could sin more and then bust hell wide open when I die. Amen. Glory to God. Now, let's get back here to speaking in tongues. But again, the ones who don't believe in speaking in tongues and the ones who say that the speaking in tongues over, those are the ones passing out the condoms and the birth control to the unmarried folk. Those are the ones who are pushing for same self sex marriage. Amen. Glory to God. They're the ones who will, who will marry homosexuals because you got clergy out there doing it. All right. Those are the ones who don't believe in speaking in tongues and they never spoken a tongue themselves. They're able to do all of this. And when you call them on the carpet about it, they'll, you're watching me now. If you're still watching, um, if you haven't turned me off yet, amen. If you haven't, you're looking for the remote control to switch me. You can't understand what the big hoo ha ha is about because you don't have the anointing. You don't have the mind of Christ. So of course you're not going to understand what the big hoo ha about. Amen. Cause all you're doing is reading the word. What did he say? The letter killeth the law, the letter killeth, but the spirit makes alive. It's the spirit that even with New Testament and grace lets you know, amen, grace does not mean that ha-ha, pass out condom and pass out birth control and just tell them when you finish, ask God to forgive you because you're under grace and he'll forgive you. Know that. And it takes the spirit to know um, what are, there are boundaries and there are limits to grace. Amen. Glory to God. There are boundaries and there are limits to grace. Amen. And, but if you don't have the Holy Spirit, only thing you'll do is read grace, get the Greek definition of the word and tell everybody you can do what you want to do, do what you want to do, do what you want to do. Just raise your hand, ask God to forgive you. And that's it. No, my friend, that's not grace. Amen. What do they talk about? Sloppy, ag greasy grace and sloppy agape. Amen. That, that saying used to get on my nerves, but after, you know, seeing that program with the TV, with all the clergy and they advertising condoms and birth control, I'm starting to understand whoever coined that phrase about the greasy grace and sloppy agape. I'm starting to see what, what, what they're, what they're talking about. Amen. You need Holy Ghost anointed people. Let me tell you something again. You go to a church where they don't believe in speaking in tongues and don't believe in being filled with the Holy Ghost, get out of there. Run. All right. Now, we are going to turn to what is arguably the heart of the um, topic of speaking in tongues. Okay? Um, turn to 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. Amen. And we are going to go through this one line at a time. And I tell you, my friend, amen, um, Crawler comes on and it gives you all our time and our um, um, stations and times when we're on. And listen, 
um, you need to take our number because sometimes due to um, um, situations beyond my control, they switch times on me and I'm supposed to be on one time and I'm looking for myself and then I'm on another time and this was finalized and that was changed just in case, you know, you come to whatever the crawler says and then you find when you come right place, right time, right station and I'm not there, give us a call and we can let you know what's what. Uh, then again, um, so you can record the program, set up your VCR, y'all remember that, amen, or whatever you got, your TiVo, whatever, amen, because we're going to get into some stuff, amen, that you're going to need to listen to over and over again, particularly if you've never heard this before, if your church doesn't teach it, you know, we, we are taught in the apostolic church to speak in tongues, that we're supposed to speak in tongues, and we have to speak in tongues, amen, and they work with us at the altar, amen, that's, that's one of the wonderful things among many other things of the apostolic church. They want to know, are you filled with the Holy Ghost? You've been baptized. You haven't been baptized filled with the Holy Ghost. They, they, they keep a fire lit under you until you get baptized and until you get filled with the Holy Spirit. But then too many times after you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you're left off, you're set off, and then the next one who's tarrying, they go work with that one, and they don't really tell you, okay, now that you're filled with the Holy Spirit, what's next? You get baptized, you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, they say, okay, the next step is you got to be baptized. Okay, you get baptized, if you don't speak in tongues in the, in the water, they say, okay, the next step is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and then after they, you get filled with the Holy Spirit, they don't tell you what the next step is like that's it and no my friend that's not it well we are going to the next step of what is supposed to be going on now that you're filled with the holy spirit now that you're baptized amen and you're filled with the holy spirit what now uh first corinthians 14 now he has just come out of what we call the love chapter the love chapter between um, 1 Corinthians 12, where he talks about the different gifts and he likens them to the parts of the body, okay? Then he goes into um, chapter 13, because even though he talks about the gifts, he says, all right, now we talk about the apostle and the disc gift and the administration and da-da-da-da, but now, out of all of this, let me tell you what the greatest um, out of all of these are, and that's walking in love, okay? And he goes through that because he says, you know, I could be an apostle, I could be a prophet, I could be all of this stuff, but though I speak with the tongues, this is um, 1 Corinthians 13. Well, let's start at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 31, and go straight into um, Corinthians 13, verse 1. Um, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and have not love, I am a, become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mystery and in all knowledge, and have all faith, and that, see, so he goes through the nine gifts that he um, talked about, in 1 Corinthians 12, and he shows you as great as these are, if they're not ministered with, and they don't come from a heart of love, they are worthless. Okay, so we go through that in, in 13, and maybe we'll deal with that. We've dealt with that in um, broadcast back, but it might be time to um, go in that again, but not right now. Right now, we go into chapter 14, and he says, all right, so follow after charity, chapter, verse 13, okay? Um, in fact, let's go to chapter 13, verse 13, go straight into 14, verse 1. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Why is charity the greatest? Because another writer, the Apostle John, tells us God is love, and whosoever abideth in love or lives in love lives in God. He says, he that does not abide in love does not know God. Two different writers, amen, but if you put them together, that's what um, the po Apostle Paul is trying to get to because remember we were talking about how the Corinthian church one of their greatest problems was division you go read first Corinthians start at verse 1 chapter 1 Paul builds them up a little pats them up on the back a little bit and then he delves into their division amen and um, we most of us 
know the story of what went on in um, Corinth, in Corinth, where a man was sleeping with his father's wife, where that would have been the first thing most preachers would have addressed. Paul didn't address that to the fifth chapter. He dealt with the the division um, and the animosities first, the cliques first. He hit um, five, dealt with that man who was doing that ungodly thing, and then he started getting back into things about division. Amen. Glory to God. So in chapter 13, he's hitting on that division thing again because he's telling them, no, you got that. You got all these gifts and y'all are so great. Yeah, but you need to excel in love just like you're excelling in these other gifts. All right. So now that he dealt with the love, now we're going to go back in and start talking about the gifts again. Because another thing that was going on in the Corinth church is that they were out of order with the gifts. So He's, he's addressing the division. He's addressing them using the gifts and they're not doing it in love. One of the reasons there was confusion in the church is because people were doing it in a puffed up way. They weren't doing it in a spirit of humility and love. So he's, he's, he's dealing with the division. He's dealing with these people who have these gifts and they don't know how to use them. Now, remember also having said that you got to remember this that they did not have the New Testament like we have it. They have the gifts of the Spirit. There's nothing in the Old Testament about how to conduct yourself with speaking in tongues and all of that because they didn't have it in the Old Testament. Amen. So Paul... Part of the problem was that they were out of order um, because people were puffed up and doing things in pride and not walking in love. Another part of the issue was they were trailblazers. They were going places that people hadn't been before and they needed to be trained just like we do. And now abides faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity again, because God is love. And he that abideth in God abideth in love. He that doesn't abide in love knows not God. Scripture says that. And you want to argue with it? You, you take it up with the writer, not with me. And the writer is God I'm talking about, not just the people who were the scribes to write it down. Okay. But the greatest of these are charity. Follow after charity. Let me stop here and say this. All of the New Testament was letters. Okay. In the book of Chronicles, Chron a chronicler is a historian. So in the book of Chronicles, in the book of first Kings, second Kings, first Samuel, second Samuel, the writer there was writing down in the old Testament. Those are books of history and they were writing so that the people of Israel would know their history. So they were chronicling things. That is not the case in the new Testament. The New Testament, every book in what we call the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation were letters. All right. When Jesus appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos, what did he tell him? Write to the seven churches, write a letter. All right. So there were no verses and chapters in letters. You don't write verses and chapters in letters. It's just one long page and a page and here a lot of pages and pages. Amen. But when they compiled the Bible and put it in its present form, they put verses and chapters so that we would be able to find it and everybody can be quote unquote really on the same page, uh, you know, when we go to read something, but chapter and verses were not in the original manuscripts or the versions. So a lot of times chapter and verses are cut in between a thought and you'll think that the writer is starting a complete, a different thought, but it's a continuation and you need to ignore that chapter and verse um, demarcation. So that's what we're going to do. So verse 13, chapter 13. And now abides faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you prophesy. Okay. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Okay. 
Point number one, in verse four, it says, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. If you have a better Bible, that word unknown is in italics, in the funny, funny slanted writing. That means it was not in the original uh, manuscripts of versions. It was put in there by the pr privilege of the translator. The original manuscript says, but um, he that speaketh in a tongue, glossia, amen, in another language edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Okay. He is not saying that prophesying is better than speaking in tongues. Okay. Now, we have to differentiate. What are we talking about? All right. We are still talking about a thought that we picked up in 1 Corinthians 12 about the gifts coming and manifesting to profit with all, which is 1 Corinthians 12, 7. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all, a profit everybody. This is talking about when the gift is used in the church as a gift. Okay, there are two, um, uh, uh, two classifications, yeah, let's use that word, two classifications of tongues. There is the classification of tongues as a gift that is used before the whole body, the church, and there is the classification of tongues for personal use. Now, they're the same speaking in tongues, but it depends on when and where you do it, um, which one you're operating in. Okay, we've all been in this situation, or most of us anyway have been in this situation, been in services like this. And this is the kind of thing that was happening at the Corinthian church. And we're going to see it later as we go on. Somebody's up talking. The pastor's up preaching. And in the middle of him preaching, somebody stands up and starts bellowing at the top of their lungs and tongues. Interrupts the whole service. Praise the Lord. I hope you enjoyed the teaching today. Uh, if you like a copy of today's program, just use the um, contact information that's appeared on your screen. Get in contact with us. Amen. Uh, get in contact with us also if you would like to join us, uh, be a part of a ministry, be a part of this great teaching. Amen. Give us a call and we'll give you the pertinent information about where, when, how, why, and all that good stuff. Amen. If you are not born again, let me invite you to come out of the desert of sin. Amen. Because you're going to die out there. Amen. Glory to God. But Jesus came so that you can have life. If you're tired, if you're sick, sick and tired of living the way you've been living, and uh, getting beat up by the devil, it's easy. Uh, let me change that. It's not easy. Jesus did the hard part. Uh, he left the easy part for us. All you have to do is accept him. Something as simple as saying, Lord Jesus, take my life and do something with it. Something as simple as saying, Lord, I know um, that I'm a sinner and I need help. I can't save myself. I ask you to forgive me. Wash me in your blood. Come into my life and be my Lord. It's as easy as that, my friend. And listen, if that's the decision you've made today, you took the first step on a journey of a thousand miles. You need to be in a good church home. Wherever you are in the United States, you give us a call and we will be able to direct you to a good church in your area. Until next time, this is Pastor Samuel Morris and the Oasis. God bless you.